word this morning, Lord. I do not for a moment presume to be an expert in this, master the Bible. No, no way. My mind's open, my heart's open. Teach us, lead us, and guide us by the Holy Spirit. In thy name I pray, amen. Now, this is the beginning. This is what this is all about. This is why when you you walk out of this building today and you be outside in the world, this is why the people out there act the way they do. This is where you came from. Plain of words, this is the heart and soul of what follows throughout the Bible because this is the beginning. This is where the fall takes place. Man's a fallen creature. And he wasn't made to fall, but in the providence of God, he fell. In Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made them aprons. So now we have a problem, and that problem is we have disobedience. But all the elements of uh, sin are found right here. This is a really, it's a powerful, powerful little section to explain some things to us about God, his wisdom, and relationship to man. Well, let's ask a question right off the bat. There's an awful lot of smart people out here. They think. And when they, you give them the Bible like this, They'll say to you, well, why did God let them sin in the beginning when he knew when he made man he was going to sin? What's your answer? you have an answer? Here's the problem. The church tries to simplify everything and make it black and white and, you know, easy to understand. It's not easy to understand. God had a reason for making man. The reason he had for making man is that one day man would be able to reside in the presence of God because man is made in the image of God. But he wants man to be there as a mature creature. Mature. In plain words, he wants man to go down a path. He wants him to go down a trail to where he begins to understand the greatness of God and of his creation and of his creatures and to realize that to be made in the image of God it's not only a blessing, but it's a great responsibility. And that one day we shall be like him and we'll see him as he is. No angel in the Bible, as I've said to you so many times before, has any of these promises. None of them. But man is made in the image of God. In order for man to understand God, God has to reveal himself. He has to reveal himself. That's one of the great purposes of the Bible is for God to reveal himself. This is the issue that Satan took up in the book of Genesis 3 with our parents, how he mentioned something about God, and he said, God doth know. Well, he told the truth. God doth know. He also told the truth when he said that when you eat this, that you'll be as God, knowing good and evil. That's true. They were. No question about it. We have Satan... Uh, not interceding, but just interjecting himself into this thing, forcing his way into it, to cause a division between God and man. When man was made, he became the immediate, the immediate, uh, drew the immediate hatred of Satan. 
because Satan knew an angel. He knew a cherubim because that's what he is. He knew a seraphim. He knew all the creatures. But here's something absolutely new. This is a man. And he understood when God made the man, he's made in the image of God. He understood that. He knew this man was special. He knew the man had come to replace him. So Satan's hatred for God is, uh, hatred for man rather, is unbounded. Unbounded. It's, there's, there's a visceral hatred. And he still has it. He hates us. He hates us with a passion. But God must reveal himself to a man. And so how does he reveal himself to us? Well, angels knew God was holy. Cherubim knew God was holy. All of these creatures knew that God was holy. And yet one of the cherubim, the fifth cherub, fell, Ezekiel 28. Even though he knew all about the holiness of God. Isaiah 14 says, he said, I will be like the Most High. He understood so much about God. Had a desire to be like him. I will be like the Most High. So here on this earth, the nature of God, the purpose of God, the mind of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and all these characteristics that make up who he is are going to be manifested. In plain words, if they hadn't fallen, they couldn't be redeemed. If they hadn't sinned, they couldn't be saved. In other words, God did not make a machine and put it in the garden. He made a man. And the lesson to learn from this text is that there are two competing for your soul. And you can read about them in the book of Job. They're in competition for your soul. One of them's God and the other's the devil. He tells you plainly in the book of Peter, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan's after you. So there's a competition going on. Ultimately, and this is jumping into the future a good bit, but ultimately God will show to all of his creation that goodness, mercy, grace, and love is by far above and beyond, eminently greater than evil and wicked and vile and corrupt. Because the two of them now are clashing they are in combat. They are in mortal combat. Evil and good. And the only one who is able to come into this world and present to mankind the victory over evil and had the power to give us the victory over evil and to show how that victory is won is the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came, Satan came after him. Oh, my, did he ever. If you'll remember, he tried to destroy him when he was born. He tried to throw him off of a cliff when he lived at Nazareth. He tried to kill him. The Lord Jesus was vulnerable. He had to be. Because when he fought Satan in Satan's kingdom, he had to fight him on his own grounds, on his own terms. Satan had to have every opportunity. He had the same opportunities that Christ had. And this is where it comes. This is why this happened in Genesis 3. And it's something to make you think. Because, yes, he knew that man would sin. He knew that man would fall. But he knew he would send a redeemer. And in the process of redemption of mankind, he would teach men something about his character. And there's one thing I've learned. I've learned this. If I've learned anything, I've learned this well. If you really know him, and the more you know of God, I'm not talking about some junk you've heard preached from somebody. I'm talking about your own personal relationship. If you really know him, you'll love him because he's a good God. The Bible says the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The more that you mature and the more you understand yourself and realize your weaknesses and your shortcomings and your failures, the more you'll appreciate the mercy of God and the grace of God. You'll love him more. You'll look at yourself with eyes of maturity and you'll say to yourself, I should have been sent to hell for that. I deserve that. I earned that. I fought hard for it. And, but he was good to me. He was good to me. That's the nature of God. 
And it'll take a time, it'll take time for his creatures to all see that, the nature of God. He won't tell them, he'll show them. That's the greatest way to learn anything. Like they say, you don't know anything about somebody, you're married to them. They say the two ways to find out something about a person is marry him or work with them. <laughs> we'll know him. So why did he let sin enter into the world? To show man who he is. That's why. Show him who he is. And the only way they could really see him for who he was is to see him through the darkness and see the light, to see him through the problems and realize he's the, he's the one that is above and beyond, that greater than anything you would ask or think. He's God. He's God. And everyone, my dear friend, has an opportunity and will have an opportunity to know him. In the book of Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He has an attack on God. That's how it starts. Attack on God. You may not admit it today, but every one of you have questions about God. You have questions either about what he's done in your life or what he did to somebody you loved or things that you don't understand about life. And if you think you've got life all figured out, you're living in a bubble. <clears throat> you're self-deceived. Because there are so many things about life we'll never figure out. This is why it says we see through a glass darkly. So he attacked, he assaulted the character of God. That's arrogance. But this is what he has to do because this is the foundation of all it. If you believe that God is a gracious, benevolent, merciful being that is for you, if God be for you, who can be against you? Then you can live for him in a manner where you didn't think you could ever live for him. You can live for him. And you can draw nigh to him. And you can bring your problems and your troubles and your sorrows to him. Because he's for you. If you can't see the difference between the revelation of the Old Testament God and the New Testament Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't see that, then you need to get on your knees and do some serious praying. Because there's only one God. But God is not dealing with the nation of Israel from a throne of grace. He's dealing with the nation of Israel as a sovereign and has given them a sovereign. And therefore they answer to him from the law that he gave them at Gerizim. And they said all that he says we'll do. And the apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians they brought a curse down upon themselves. For cursed is every man that continueth not in all things that are written in the law. Well who has ever kept all of it? So they were living under the constant condemnation of a curse. This is why Paul made it plain to them in Galatians. He said, you want to go back under the law? You're going back under a curse. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, he took and stripped away that curse of the law and became a curse for us and went to the cross and he died. And he opened up a way to God that wasn't available before. He rent that temple, that, uh, that curtain in the temple from the top to the bottom. And there's a new and a living way. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God in his fuller manifestation. So the tack is upon God. And let me tell you, Mark it down. When you get out here in this world and people begin to attack God, they'll attack him in the Old Testament. Over and over and over and over and oh, ad nauseum. It won't be through the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not attack God through Christ. They will attack him with the God of the Old Testament. Now, all you got to do is read a little bit and you'll see that. These fellows, they are... And they, listen, what makes you... How do you why do you not... Look at all the disciples that they've made. Where's the church failing? Have we failed to get the message out? Look what it says in the book of Revelation. He said, neither repented they, neither repented they, neither repented they, neither repented they. But the book of Revelation was not necessarily written to get you saved. The book of Revelation is written as an observation to show you how corrupt an apostate man has become. That's what Revelation is about. And he gives you a principle when he says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. He allows men to go so far. I read a thing a couple of days ago where this woman said that she likes a threesome now. And she says, it has made me a better person. Think of that. Think about that. And over there in Europe, just the other day, they broke up an orgy. Eighty-something people. 
And some of those people in that thing were high officials, elected government officials throughout Europe. Yet they were there. Where's it leading to? It's leading to the pit. Man without God is lost, absolutely, completely lost, lost, lost. Without God. Without Him. And He's showing you that. He's showing you what to expect because it's only begun. You've only seen the beginning of it. This wickedness and vileness and this corruption is going to come like a wave. It's going to come like that tsunami that hit Japan a few years ago. It's going to be horrible when it shows it's coming. So the number one issue, the number one issue, the number one issue in the Bible is the character of God. Amen. Because if you trust in his character and trust in who he is, you can put up with about anything. But if you can't trust him and don't know if he's really for you, and if you don't know that he's playing games with you, or he's weak and Satan is stronger, then you'll, 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 you'll forever live in a dog fight in a battle. Notice the second thing, verse number four. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not die. Look at verse one. He was more subtle. Subtlety. Now, most people, most, most issues, when they deal with the devil, deal with him on the level of, well, the devil made me do it. The devil tempted me to, 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 uh, to uh, fornication. The devil got me drunk. The devil this, devil that, devil this, devil that. Let me tell you something. For the most part, the devil doesn't need me around when you do these things. Your flesh will take care of that. It says in the book of James, chapter 1, if a man sins or is tempted when he's drawn away by his own flesh, his own lust, his own flesh, and enticed. Amen. Why? Because your flesh is fallen. Your flesh is a nature. It lusteth against the Holy Ghost. That's what it says. Satan works at a much higher level. The closer you get to God, the more theological he becomes. The more dedicated and consecrated in your heart you become, where you want to serve the Lord, the more subtle are his paths to lead you astray and pull you off from the way and get you busy. Busy, busy, busy. He has, he, has, he has unlimited tactics. This is Satan. This is subtle, his subtlety. He's, he, the Bible says we're not, we're not ignorant of his tactics. Logistics. The way he does things. He's, he's a master of it. I was listening to a man the other day and he said, he said that, uh, that uh, Felix, his wife, Drusilla, Drusilla in the book of Acts. How I many you know who I'm talking about now? Felix said uh, when he trembled, when he heard the word of God, he trembled. You know, and he, literally he was scared to death. Well, rightfully so, because he's going out into judgment. Right? He understood himself before a holy God. He had no hope. And, Paul, and he said to Paul, he said, I'll, in a more convenient time, I'll talk to you about that. As far as we know, that convenient time never came. But Josephus is a first century historian. He's a Jewish historian. Josephus, we, we, you know, we appeal to him a lot. A lot of the stuff you hear came straight from Josephus, whether they give him credit for it or not. And he says that Drusilla, the wife of Felix, was at Vesuvius in 79 AD. Is that when it erupted? Vesuvius, it erupted 79 AD and killed all those people and the ash that came down upon them literally made if uh, you know they they the ash the body uh, was gone but the ash left an imprint and they just filled it up with stuff and there they could see the the way the person had died and uh, he says that Drusilla died there with her child in 79 AD and here's what he said he said good ending for a adulteress no, that's not a good ending. He takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. You should take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. That's the wrong spirit. You remember what the disciples said? The Lord called fire down from heaven. That's exactly what Elijah did. The Lord said, you don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come into the world to condemn men, destroy them. I came to save them. Now, Elijah did call fire down from heaven. And consumed them. Did it more than once. But that, as I remember, is that Old Testament God. Same God. But we're dealing with people under the law and the sovereignty of a land and a kingdom that he'd given to them. 
big difference. Don't call down fire from heaven. There's a preacher out here somewhere out there in Arizona. He gets up in the pulpit and he says, God ought to kill all the homosexuals. God ought to kill them. They need to be killed. They ought all, they all ought to be dead. Is that so? No. Preach the gospel to them. Preach the gospel. And you can see them saved. See their life change. Down through the years, I've had communication with homosexuals through the mail. And uh, they'll, they'll send me emails and this and that, communicate with us. And nowhere, for, nowhere have I gotten up and said, God ought to kill homosexuals. Now, we'll let God take care of the judgment. But in this life, right now, Christ died for homosexuals. He died for people to go to orgies. He died for the whole lot. He tasted death for every man. And we should take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. <coughs> None whatsoever. So he's subtle. He's subtle. Don't try to outsmart him. Just stick with the Bible and pray. I want you to notice something else about him. Look at verse number 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. She's communing with him. Communication. The word communicate, broken down, means to commune. It means to speak, have spoken to you. Speak, speak back. That's what commune means, communication. Koinonia, over there in the book of First John, two people have something in common, so they communicate. Here she's communicating with the devil. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, so forth and so on. He wants to communicate with you. A small, still voice told me to kill my family. There's a fellow named Charles Lawson that lived back in the 20s in North Carolina. <laughs> I saw that the other day and I thought, uh-oh. Hope they got the date right. He killed his whole family. Eight people. He murdered them. It's awful what he did. Terrible what he did. And then after he killed them, he went out in the woods and he went around a tree and went around that tree and around that tree and around that tree. And he walked and walked and walked, walked and walked and walked and walked and finally took the shotgun and killed himself. I wonder what voice he was listening to. And this happens all the time. Up here in the mountains, East Tennessee, a fellow by the name of Bishop killed his family, brought him up here and and burn the car and burn the grave or something, all he did up there. And he's been on the run for over 40 years. He can't run away from his conscience, and he can't run away from his soul. Don't listen to the devil. If he starts talking to you about some wicked, vile, godless thing, the Bible said there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted above that you're able. Will the temptation make a way of escape? Get on do ungodly, wicked feelings, wrestle in your breast. Get a hold of the Lord and call upon him. You never know what's liable to happen. Communication with the devil. As I've told you before, I've had a good talk with the devil, and every once in a while I'll agree with him. He makes a lot of sense. When it comes to rational, everyday understanding of your relation to people and their relation to you and your relation with your work and problems of life and so forth, Satan can be a very good counselor. He really can. He really can. He can make you feel like you're the victim like you wouldn't believe. Oh, he'll make you the victim. And if you're the victim, then that means that anything you do to assuage your victimhood is okay. And that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Listen, talk to the Lord. Here's the fourth thing about it. In verse number four, verse number five, rather, for God doth know that in the day you eat there, if your eyes shall be open, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, the, day, the eyes will be open, and you will know good and evil, and you, the, the light will shine in your soul so bright that you couldn't, you, you, you've never seen anything in this world like it. You will know far more than you know now. But they weren't ready for it. You see, that was the problem. They weren't ready for it. Satan, therefore, distorted the truth. 
This is one of his most wicked tactics, is to take the truth, twist the truth, and make his own application of that truth. And you know it's the truth, but it just seems strange the way he's applying it. That's the devil. That's the devil. God does not tempt you to do evil, and God will not lead you wrong. He'll not lead you in the wrong way. Watch this. Look at verse number 6. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took thereof and did eat. Desirable thing. Is sin a desirable thing? Well, of course it is. People don't torture themselves. There's pleasure in sin for a season, the Bible says. But all it takes is a while. First thing you know, you are into it so deep that you can't find a way out. And the ultimate goal of Satan and sin is for you to kill yourself. Suicide. He wants to do away with you. Do you in. In other words, it's desirable. It's desirable. And the people out here in this world, they live for the flesh. They live for, that's all they live for. What they see, what they feel, that's it. That's all they live for. Uh, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Look at verse number 7, though. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Shame. This is shame. The Bible talks about the face of a whore. I had a woman say to me about 30 years ago, I used the word whore from the pulpit. <gasps> I thought to myself, you, she said to me, she said, I can't believe you said that. I said, lady, <laughs> that's what the Bible says. You see what happens to us? We can get very self-righteous. That's a Pharisee. He has no shame. And this is what a whore has no shame in her face. There's no feelings in her face. And this is what he's talking about. So you see, they had shame. That's a good thing. They knew they were naked and they wanted to cover themselves. Shame is a good thing. Because shame will leave you to conviction and repentance. Shame is good, but how many jaded people out there in this world today have no shame? They're in your face. You accept me for who I am and the way I am, or you can just hit the road. That's the idea. That's their attitude. No shame. Because sin has a hardening effect. It hardens the conscience. Hardens the soul. And uh, eventually it leads to damnation. Look at verse number 8 now. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walk in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. This is alienation. This is one of the elements of sin. Sin starts with an attack on God, attack on his character, by subtlety, by lies, by deceit, by Satan communing, communicating with you. And then he distorts the truth. That's one of his major weapons. And then he presents to you a desirable alternative. And then shame. Shame comes upon you. When this happens, thank God for shame. And then alienation takes place. Sin separates you from fellowship with God. You want to know why you're constantly searching, seeking something religious to make you feel better? It's because your flesh... Your flesh is now jaded, and you have to have an excitable thing. <clears throat> Walking in fellowship with God, it's not what is presented to you from the outside. It's what's on the inside. You, yes, it's what's on the inside. Your fellowship with God does not come because you're moved emotionally and stirred by something outside. Your communication and fellowship with God comes because of your walk with the Lord that's on the inside. This is why your joy, God, the joy of the Lord, your strength. Joy doesn't come from outward, outward, what's put before you. Joy arises from the inside of the soul. And so there's alienation. We've all experienced it. I've got a picture of a dog on my, uh, I saw the other day on YouTube. It's the best thing I've ever seen in my life, puppy. And some of these animals amaze me at some of them, of the, uh, 
human-like features you see. And here sits this little puppy, and its eyes are up like that. I think it's a beagle. And it's sitting there, and it's, and, it's, and it's not looking at you straight in the face. Its face is forward, but its eyes are turned upward. And it's the most pitiful looking thing. But you see, it's the eyes and face of no trust. That puppy doesn't trust you now. Or yet. This is what happens when alienation takes place. That's the biggest, that's, that's the ultimate goal of alienation. Is to break the trust between you and the Lord. A lot of people are awake. They, they are, they, they are, um, uh, they haven't yet been wakened. You got saved. Thank God for that. But you still have, don't understand that that old, wicked, vile, corrupt man is still with you. He's still there. He's still there. And God knew it when he saved you. And that old, vile, wicked, corrupt man will never Live for God, walk with Him, have communication with Him. Won't happen. Because that they cannot. They're enemies, one to the other. It's impossible for the old, vile, wicked, corrupt, godless uh, man, the old nature that you are. Can't happen. So what Satan wants to do, he wants to destroy what you see yourself to truly be. Is when you first got saved. I mean, the 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 burden was lifted. I mean, you felt free. You felt light as a feather. Joy flooded your soul. You couldn't under you couldn't you couldn't believe that there could be some life like this. You had a hunger for the Word of God. You had a hunger for God. You started reading your Bible and praying. You started seeking out people of like faith. You wanted to go to church. All these things began to move in your heart and in your soul. And that's a wonderful thing. And however long it does, it's some people, people are different, but eventually the old man wakes back up and he starts to move in your life. And that's when Satan pulls one of his dirtiest tricks He'll come along and say to you, well, now, you know what happened to you. That's okay, but that was just kind of emotional. You know, you just got worked up religiously. You're still the same old person you used to be. That's, his de that's the devil. That's, that's Satan. What's he done? He wants you to remain alienated from God. And if you're born again, he can't change that. That's your state. That's your standing. That's your place in Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. He can't change that. He can't take that away from you. But he can sure take your joy and your, and your victory and your walk and your communication. He can take all of that away from you and leave you down there back down in Lodi Bar. Or he can leave you out there under a juniper tree. Or he can put you on the back side of the desert. He's got all kinds of places he can put you once that alienation takes place. So how do I get it back? You don't get it back. He's already done it for you. Another, big, another biggest lie that you'll ever hear from Satan is this. Well, I've got to do something to get this thing. Now, what do I do? You don't do anything. He's already done everything. So what do you mean by that? That means you reach in there and you take hold of Christ and he becomes everything that you want. He's your sanctification. He's your separation. He's your holiness. He's your forgiveness. He's your healer. He's your savior. He's all. He's everything. Everything that you need is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So what do you do? You take him at his word. He says, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You'd come to him and you, you lay your, if you want to do as Hezekiah did, lay your case before him. Lay your case before him. And you'll find that he's merciful and gracious and long-suffering. You'll find the Lord Jesus Christ will receive you back. You'll find that he'll forgive you and he'll love you and he'll give you what you need to live a Christian life. You'll find that the Son of God will do what he did when he went to the cross. I mean, he that spared not his own son, how shall he also with him fully give us all things? Christ Jesus went to the cross for you, folks. And that's a horrible, horrible death. Can you imagine him turning you away? No, he won't turn you away. So put your mind on him. Set your affections on him. Take hold of him. Draw nigh to him. And let the Lord Jesus Christ become once again the object of your love and your affection 
and, and your mind and your heart. You get up in the morning, you think about him. Throughout the day, you think about him. You're talking to him. <coughs> you're praying. He said, well, preacher, I've got to clean up a lot of things. All right, you go right ahead and clean them up. How do you feel when you come to God after you've cleaned them up? Oh, what do you mean? Well, don't you take a little credit for that? I mean, can't you? Well, no, Lord, you know, I mean, I'm serious about this. Look at all the stuff I've quit and all the other. Yeah, I know all about it. You can't handle it. You know why? Because it builds self-righteousness in you. He's already cleaned it up. He's paid for it. Now, when you got saved, and I got saved in 73, when I got saved, I didn't remember all the sins that I'd committed. You know what I did? The fact of the matter is, when I was sitting on that sofa, I didn't get down there and start repenting of everything that I'd ever done, all that I was. You know what I did? I bowed my head and I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart. And man, when I raised my head back up, I was a new person. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. Bang. <laughs> That's what you ought to do. Lord Jesus, I've drifted. I'm out here in left field. I got all kinds of stuff popping up in my life that shouldn't be there. And I know you love me and I love you, but I'm not where I ought to be. Lord Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, and take me, pull me, let, help me, show me, come to you. Let me draw nigh to you. And you know what he'll do? He'll put those big arms around you that he had stuck at at Calvary. He'll embrace you. He'll pull you in. And he will cleanse you. And he'll wash you in his blood. And he'll forgive you. And he'll plant you again by by the rivers of living water. And he'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. And he'll do everything that you need to live the Christian life. Everything you need to live the Christian life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. If there was anything not in him, that means it's left up to human agency and human ability and it's not going to work. Amen. So you think an awful lot of the Lord Jesus, don't you? I think everything of him. Amen. You go to some churches and they preach about their preacher. You go to some churches and they preach about their buildings. You go to some churches and they preach about their history. You go to some churches and they preach about each other. <laughs> you go to some churches and it's all about a man. It's all about a thing. It's all about a movement. It's all about this and that and this and that. But it's not about Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. He's our life, folks. He's our absolute life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Amen. He's everything. So, if you haven't been talking to him, now's a good time to start talking to him again. And if you're born again, you know what it is to come to him. Nobody's got to show you. Nobody's got to show you. And it says over there in Romans chapter number 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? Have you noticed how no words were put in there? It doesn't say, For whosoever shall say these words shall be saved. Have you noticed that? It doesn't say that. It just says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It gives you some things to believe, but it doesn't tell you what to say. So what do you say, preacher? What comes out of your heart? That's what you say. Amen. Brother Keith Tickell, dismiss us, please.